Well, I devoted uh, 25 years of my career as a scientist to study the, biodeg the biodegradation of lignin, by far the most recalcitrant natural polymer on Earth. Today, I will refer to the biodegradation of plastics, which are highly recalcitrant synthetic polymers. More specifically, since this plenary session is about science and sustainability, I would like to address the topic of increasing concern which is a heavy contamination of the oceans with plastic material. This appears as a paradigmatic case in which scientific knowledge is the, deemed to play an essential role in the design of public policies for the protection of the environment. I would like to start my presentation by quoting Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, precisely devoted to the environment and human ecology. In number 21 of the encyclical, the Pope asserts that each year hundreds of millions of tons of waste are generated, much of it non-biodegradable. Then he adds that the growing problem in marine waste, of marine waste and the protection of the open seas represent particular challenges. As you well know, La Data Sea also includes an urgent appeal to protect our common home by bringing the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development. Now, a few words concerning the plastic industry and the final destination of plastic waste. Plastics are a suitable material for multipurpose use due to their low cost, high durability, and resistance to physical breakdown. At present, global plastic production reaches about 300 million tons per year. Unfortunately, disposal of waste plastic is problematic due to its inherent resistance to decomposition. Some plastic material is recycled, although the majority is placed in landfills where it may take centuries to break down. Of particular concern are plastic debris that end up in the marine environment. This outcome may result from accidental loss deliberated release, or poor waste management practices. As revealed in a recent study published in Science, an estimated 4.8 to 12.7 million tons of plat plastic entered the oceans from land-based sources in 2010. This is equivalent to one municipal garbage truck dumping its content to the ocean every minute. If ocean-based sources such as fishing and shipping are included, the input of plastic increases by 20%. Marine plastic debris include mainly beverage bottles, bags, toys, tires, cigarette filters, nets, ropes, traps, fishing lines, etc. However, although less evident to visual inspection, a severe impact is exerted by microplastics with a part particle size of up to 5 millimeters. This may consist of fragments arriving from larger plastics, micro bits used in cosmetics, resin pellets employed in the production of plastics, remnants of ship coat, etc. There have been some surveys to estimate the amount of plastics debris in the ocean. For example, this one was published by Ericsson and collaborators in PLOS One a couple of years ago. It shows that there are more than 5 trillion plastic pieces weighing more than 250,000 tons floating in the ocean. Of this, 92% correspond to microplastic particles. And this figure does not include plastics in the seabed. The same group, as well as others, have found that plastics of all sizes concentrate mainly near the five ocean gyres, where converging surface currents, trap, and mobilize floating debris towards the vortex centers. The highest concentrations are found in the North Pacific Gyre, also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Plastic debris also clusters along the coast near human communities. This slide shows the count density of plastics in the ocean classified in four size classes, from 0.33 to 1 millimeter, from 1 to 5, from 5 to 200 millimeters, and bigger than 200 millimeters. And the color bar in the right, you can see there, gives the amount of pieces observed by square kilometer. The, dark red co the darker red color represents 1 million pieces per square kilometer. 
This is another global inventory of floating plastic that we published last year by Fanceville and collaborators, which yielded a higher limit of 51 trillion pieces, weighing 236,000 tons. Both studies agree in a similar figure for the total weight of plastic debris floating in the ocean, about 250 tons. But this is only one or two percent of the global plastic waste estimated to have entered the ocean in the year 2010. So the question is, where is the missing plastic? Four main reasons uh, or have been proposed for the substantial losses of plastic uh, from the surface. Shore deposition, nanofragmentation, biofouling, and ingestion. However, as suggested by Woodall and collaborators, deep sea is the most likely fate of microplastic debris. And this is a recent publication as well, you can see in the bottom. Now, how do plastics affect the marine environment? They do so in various ways, I will just mention a few. Entanglement of birds, fish, seals, and whales in fishing gear. Floating plastics transport microbial communities to new environments, threatening native ecosystems. This may be one of the reasons your microflora is changing, takashi san <laughs> because it, lives, it travels on, on plastics. Microplastics decrease growth on, on fish larvae. Plastics are ingested by fish and seabirds. Plastics in the ocean absorb persistent or hydrophobic organic pollutants, which when ingested by the trophic fauna, be accumulated in the food chain. And plastic manufacture involves the use of potentially toxic additives, such as antioxidants, UV stabilizers, flame retardants, etc. Since most of these chemicals are lipophilic, they penetrate cell membranes when ingested. All these facts confirm that we are in the presence of a menace not only to the environment, but also to animal and human health. In this slide, you can see a few examples of ingestion and entanglements. According to a study published in the Journal of Australian Quarterly, which is cited at the bottom there, more than 100,000 sea animals die each year from eating or being caught in plastic debris. This slide shows a couple of recent publications. One of them demonstrates the consumption of plastic by deep sea fauna, whereas the other deals with the presence of plastics in seafood intended for human consumption, confirming what I just said in the sense that the environmental problem is also turning into a human health hazard. What are the possible solutions for the problem of plastic contamination in the ocean? First, public policies and agreements to prevent marine pollution. There are a series of these, and I don't have the time to mention them today, but the question is to what extent do citizens of all these signing nations comply with the, with the agreements? Also, a better waste management, including cutting down the amount of plastics in microbeads in personal care products. Third, plastic recycling, which has a cost because it requires sorting since waste contain an assortment of different plastics, and also clean up of exi existing marine debris. Various countries and NGOs perform periodical cleanup programs at a high cost. Finally, the use of biodegradable plastics and polymer blends can be a solution. For example, starch and cellulose-based plastics, bio-based polyesters such as polylactic acid, and so on. I will devote the rest of my talk to the subject of plastic biodegradation. But first, a few words about the structure of plastics. There are those with a carbon-carbon backbone. They are in the top part, part of the figure, figures such as polyethylene and polystyrene. These are highly resistant to microbial attack. However, when long polymers are fragmented by abiotic means, small oligomers can enter the cell where they are metabolized. I will soon refer to the abiotic polymer frag fragmentation. On the other hand, you may see in the bottom part of the figure, there are plastics with ester and amide linkages, and these are attacked by extracellular hydrolases. For example, this slide depicts the hydrolysis of polyethylene terephthalate by cutinase, an enzyme that cleaves ester linkages. In this case, one of the products is further metabolized and enters the Krebs cycle. Earlier this year, Yoshida and collaborators published in Science the degradation of the same polymer by a single bacterium, 
which produces two enzymes yielding aliphatic and aromatic monomers, both of which are used as carbon source for growth. Another example of a hydrolyzable plastic is polyurethane, which possesses both amide and ester bonds. Both are hydrolyzable and therefore the type of product will depend on the specificity of the enzyme catalyzing bond cleavage, which can be a urease, esterase, or protease. Well, these are all laboratory studies. The question is to what is going on in a natural environment such as the ocean? In marine environments, plastic decay takes place by a combination of four mechanisms, photodegradation, thermal degradation, mechanical action, and biodegradation. In particular, light and temperature lead to the formation of highly reactive free radicals. This slide shows the main reactions mediated by free radicals in a plastic polymer. As you may see, there are carbon-centered and oxygen-centered radicals, such as the peroxyl and the hydroxyl radicals. Some reactions end up with the fragmentation of the polymer, sometimes possessing alcohol and ketone groups. Others are cross-linking reactions that lead to products with high, higher molecular weight. This slide shows an example of a reaction of an oxygen-centered radical with a non-radical plastic polymer that produces ketone and olefin fragments. So in this case, you get a fragmentation of the polymer but through a free radical mechanism. And you also obtain a, a carbon-centered radical that will in turn react with oxygen to produce a peroxy radical and so on. It is expected that the small fragments produced in reactions involving free radicals will enter the cells of microorganisms to be further biodegraded to CO2 plus water. What do we know about marine microorganisms metabolizing plastic-derived oligo oligomers? At present, not much. However, I would like to highlight the very promising work conducted by the group led by Eric Settler from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, which refers to the characterization of the microbial community that colonizes microplastics in the ocean. <laughs> He has called these communities the platysphere. Platysphere communities vary with location, season, and polymer type. It is debatable whether the biofilm that these bacteria form on, on the surface of, of the plastic may protect, may protect it from photodegradation. However, pits conforming to bacterial shape visualized on the surface strongly suggest plastic decay. In addition, ribosomal RNA surveys confirm the presence of hydrocarbon degrading bacteria. This work is only starting, and there is so much to be learned with respect to biochemical mechanisms leading to plastic degradation by these communities in their own environment. Whatever these mechanisms may be, one point is for sure. Plastic biodegradation is a very slow process, even under ideal laboratory conditions. One may ask then, what can be done to make plastics more prone to biodegradation, not only in the ocean, but in any environment? This slide expands the, option, the options to non-hydrolyzable fossil fuel-derived plastics that I mentioned previously. They are to use plastics of petrochemical origin that are biodegradable, as the ones that I showed previously with uh, you know, ester linkages and so on, to use biodegradable plastics based on starch and cellulose or produced by bacteria, all these known as bio-based plastics, Another possibility is blending conventional plastics with bio-based biodegradable plastics, such as starch, and use oxo biodegradable plastics, so-called because they contain pro-oxidant additives that facilitate weathering by light and heat. Bio-based bio plastics seem to be a promising solution. However, their actual presence in the market is only marginal. In this slide, the orange, co the orange color denotes the worldwide plastic production, which is in the neighborhood, as I said, of 300 million tons per year. The blue color uh, corresponds to the production of plastic in Europe. And the very tiny uh, green strip that you can see at the right side in the bottom corresponds to bio-based plastics. We may have to wait several more years to confirm whether they will succeed in replacing traditional plastic. On the other hand, we must keep in mind that bio-based plastics are not a panacea, as ascertained by a recent report entitled Biodegradable Plastics and Marine Litter, issued by UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Program. According to this report, among other drawbacks, 
bio-based plastics tend to be more expensive. Also, they must be separated from fossil fuel-based uh, fuel plastics for recycling. Then, their efficient biodegradation occurs under conditions that are very rarely, if ever, met in the marine environment. And finally, labeling a product as biodegradable may result in a greater inclination to litter on the part of the public. As I just said, only time will tell whether bio-based plastics succeed in replacing non-hydrolyzable synthetic plastic. To conclude my presentation, I would like to outline some future tasks that I think are relevant in this very critical issue of plastics in the ocean. First, reiterate the need for better waste management, for recycling, for cleaning up the existing marine debris, and for proper public policies to prevent marine pollution, and to comply with those policies, of course. Then, to continue studies on plastic biodegradation in the oceans. To date, most work reported in the literature correspond to experiments conducted under conditions that are not relevant to the marine environment. And finally, to study the fate and environmental impact of plastic biodegradation by products. Some may be toxic or, so toxic or, or even more recalcitrant than plastic. And also of additives and persistent organic pollutants adsorbed to the plastics in the ocean. Thank you very much for your attention.